to everyone. I was going to say how, how honored I am to be able to be here with such creative people. Um, by the way, I was asked earlier on how you should address me because some people kept on calling me uncle. So <laughs> as the oldest speaker you've ever had probably and the oldest guy in the room for sure today and a newly minted granddad of uh, one week old. So <laughs> absolutely. So you can call me KP. You don't call me granddad and you don't call me uncle, okay? <laughs> so that's the ground rules. Um, the second thing is I, I was going to say how honored I am to be here, etc. Until I discovered uh, from one of the co-organizers, the, the prettiest one around, I hope, where is that co-organizer? Uh, my daughter. So I asked her, wow, for what, you know, how did I deserve this honor of coming to speak at 8.15 in the morning? By the way, before I ever knew the origins of uh, Creative Mornings, I knew it had to be American. What other people would get up at 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Who originated breakfast meetings and so on? So I was completely right. It's completely an American phenomenon. But um, I was also told by one of the co-organizers um, that you know, my presence here would be very good. I could talk about branding, and I know a lot about branding. Bantry is all about branding. So I dug a little bit more, and I asked her, how long have you had this thing? And she said, well, we've had it for three years, every month. So I said, oh, okay, that's 36 people, right? She said, yeah, at least. And then I said, you're probably running out of creative people. And she said, how do you know? <laughs> then I asked, uh, what did you do next? She said, well, then we, we ran out of creative people. So then we had entrepreneur types. And then we ran out, out of that also. <laughs> so I asked her, what are you doing now? She said, well, we try to get people whom we know. And we <laughs> so have sympathy for Creative Mornings. They're really, I guess, I hope you're not really digging at the bottom of the barrel, but uh, here I am. Um, I was at first very excited when I saw the theme that they chose for today's talk, revolution. And you saw the, the fist. That goes back to my background that most of you probably don't know anything about. And I guess I'm allowed to speak a few minutes about the raised fist and my interpretation of revolution. Because after that, I was told I'm not even supposed to talk about that kind of revolution at all. I'm supposed to talk about branding and brand revolution because most of you here are advertising types and, and creative consultants and so on. So we'll go on to that. But when I saw the raised fist, it actually brought back a lot of things to me. Um, I have actually been uh, detained by the Internal Security uh, Department in Singapore. I was thrown out of Stanford University and I am a confessed communist. Um, confessed, I had to confess on television to being a communist before being released um, from prison. And I was thrown out of Stanford University, the center of uh, techdom, uh, in the 1970s because of, I guess, political activity. And the raised fist was actually a very important part, a very important part of the graphic image of the 1970s. Today now it looks pretty retro to all of you, but for people of my generation, the baby boomer generation, there were a lot of very serious issues out there. And it's probably good for people of this generation now that the issues you're looking at, that maybe the most politicized would be about global inequality and so on, but in the 1960s, those of you who know anything about history would have remembered maybe Prague Spring would have remembered the, the Paris uprising in 68. A whole generation of people who, were, who came of age after, who were born after World War II, part of that whole baby boomer generation, in the 70s, we didn't just rebel for rebellion's sake. There were a lot of very serious issues out there. Of course, one of them was the Vietnam War. Another one was, I guess, neo-colonialism. So I grew up in, in Thailand and went to went to the US. I didn't come to Singapore until 
well, in, the, in my 20s. But I grew up in Thailand, witnessed what was happening with the Vietnam War there, went to the US, and sort of got involved in student politics. And I got thrown out of, the, of Stanford University, ironically, um, not because of my participation anti-Vietnam War activities, but because I didn't really like attending classes. <laughs> and so I was sitting out one morning at Tresida Plaza in Stanford, and a bunch of my friends from the Black Student Union decided that they were going to protest um, against someone who, if those, any of you who come from the tech community would know as a very famous Nobel Prize winner, the inventor of the transistor, uh, that was William Shockley. And William Shockley was one of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductors. He himself won the Nobel Prize for originating the whole concept of the, the transistor, which led to everything else in electronics. But he also was a great believer in eugenics. And he actually had published a book saying that black people should be sterilized and all kinds of other things should happen. So he was teaching a class in, um, in Stanford on, I guess, graduate class on electronics and so on. And all my friends from the Black Student Union decided they wanted to go and disrupt his class and challenge him to a debate. Now having nothing else to do, because it wasn't time for nighttime demonstrations yet, so you just chill out in the day waiting for nighttime demonstrations and not attending classes. So I went along with them and I went into the class and so we all went into the class, they raised up their protest signs and so on. William Shockley was very well prepared for it. He took out his Polaroid camera, took pictures of everybody, and then of course everyone just left the class after that. But he gave it to the campus judicial panel and disrupting a classroom is considered really bad because that's infringing on the academic freedom of professors. And so there was a whole trial, a hu huge trial. And like in any normal trial, you have to identify uh, the people who you think are the, I guess, the, uh, the defendants. There was like a police lineup. Uh, William Shockley couldn't recognize any one of the black people because to him they all looked alike. <laughs> Everybody in the classroom were white. There was this one Chinaman. <laughs> so this one Chinaman was identified and I was tried and I was kicked out. And after I was kicked out, William Shockley came up to me and very nicely called me Mr. Ho, and he's, I was 23. And he, thought, he said, Mr. Ho, uh, have you read my book? And I said, Professor Shockley, I'm sorry, I haven't read your book, uh, but, I, but I understand you believe in the sterilization of black people, etc." And he said, yes, I do. But you didn't read page 54, because in page 54, I say here very clearly that I think Chinese people are one of the smartest people in the world. So why are you so <laughs> dumb as to disrupt my class? <laughs> so that, that goes back to partly giving you a sense in a more humorous way about what things were like in those days. It was very heated, there were a lot of demonstrations. I got kicked out of Stanford, I was accepted to uh, Cornell, uh, which, where my sister went and my parents had graduated from, so I could have gotten a seat there, but I decided not to. The language of revolution in those days uh, was about things, it seems so quaint now, but the US was called the belly of the beast, and you had to be, if you want to be a revolutionary, you really had to engage with the people and all these other kinds of things. So I decided not to stay on in the US and to come back, to come to Singapore and serve out my national service. Uh, the first thing I did as a, uh, I guess there are many Singaporeans here who are, who've done national service. The first thing I did when I came back as a, as a real revolutionary with my hair down to here, besides having it all cut short, was I started to preach Mao Zedong thought to my platoon which didn't get me very far, as you can imagine. But I managed to, to leave the army, uh, very, very happy with the army. I mean, it, I, it served, I guess, to fill a lot of my own inner desires to find camaraderie, being a sort of displaced person, as it were. And after that, I went, I, I had a choice after national service to either go back to school in the US or somewhere, or to stay on in Singapore. Not having ever lived in Singapore, I decided to stay in Singapore. And in those days, even a Stanford degree would not be recognized. Having done three years at Stanford with pretty possible uh, GPA and so on, I, Singapore University would not take any of those credits. So I started out as year one. And it's taken me altogether, the, another irony of life is it's taken me nine years to get a simple bachelor's degree 
and here I am, the founding chairman of Singapore Management University. <laughs> so that's a real lesson in life for all of you. Those things that you think you know about, they take you nowhere. Those things that you're weakest in, they will take you somewhere. So all those of you who have done PhDs, who have done MBAs, forget it. All those of you who haven't done anything, you will get somewhere with it. So, so essentially, I stayed on in NUS. I started from year one all over again. And I was doing economics, and they had economics textbooks which were written by Stanford professors, my own professors. But I couldn't get a single credit. So it was pretty boring to be a, a third-year student in economics redoing it from year one. So again, I didn't study. So not studying and wanting to live my support myself rather than have my parents support me, I started being a journalist. I started writing about Singapore and I got into trouble. I went to jail. Uh, the really good thing that happened to me uh, in jail was the fact that when I went to jail, I was only dating a girlfriend. But she was not allowed to see me in jail uh, because she had no local stand -by. She was just a friend. Whereas after I confessed, my parents were allowed to see me before I was released. So after I, I was released, I gave a very, in my view, very romantic marriage proposal, whom my girlfriend didn't think was that romantic. And the proposal was, hey, you know, uh, last time I went to jail, uh, I couldn't see you. So if next time I go to jail, uh, we want to see each other, right? So how about we get married? <laughs> so don't you think it was romantic, right? I mean, gosh. I, I thought it was romantic. She didn't think it was so romantic. So she accepted and she took immediate revenge on me because when I was courting her, she thought I was this really handsome, dashing young guy because I was driving a motorcycle. And driving a motorcycle for guys who've ever driven motorcycles, who've had girlfriends, you know that the girlfriend who sits as a pillion rider, you kind of automatically jerk a lot so she has to hug you tighter and tighter. So <laughs> that was my game. And she took revenge on me because after we got married, she promptly banned me from riding any more motorcycles ever, ever. So she's had her revenge. Uh, since then, I guess now I can maybe segue in going into a little bit more about branding and the brand revolution that's happening here. Essentially, after, we, after I was released from jail, after I got married, I couldn't stay in Singapore anymore because of the notoriety I had. I would go to a coffee shop and people would say, he, he, he's the guy who went to jail. So I left Singapore, I uh, went with my wife to Hong Kong, I worked for the Far Eastern Economic Review. We couldn't afford to stay anywhere on Hong Kong Island or in Kowloon. Uh, journalists were paid a pittance. So we tried to live, for those of any of you who've been to Hong Kong, you know that there's an island called Chong Chao where all the expats lived. They couldn't afford there. So we went to Lama Island, which had a little fishing village. And there were expats there. There were two types of expats who lived there. Uh, hairstylists and journalists. <laughs> and Hong Kong and all the other, all the little buildings on Hong Kong Island and on Chong Chao or Lama, they were always three stories, usually built by the, the landlord. The landlord would occupy the ground floor and then the hairstylists would occupy the top floor with the sun deck, and the journalist always occupied the sandwich floor. So that was life for my wife and I for about three years in Hong Kong. It was, very, it was really idyllic because we had, there were no cars. You had to take a ferry every day to Hong Kong Island where I worked, and she was doing her master's degree. And uh, it, was, it was really truly a, an idyllic fishing village where we didn't have much money. The point about branding that I'm going into here now is that when we decided later on to form the company that we now call Banyan Tree, we had to think of a name for a resort brand. You could have seagulls, you could have, I guess, rainforest, you could call it cocoa palms and all the kinds of things that supposedly are redolent of the tropics and so on. We didn't want any of that. We wanted a name that would resonate for us and a brand that we thought carried the values that we need to express to other people. And that ties in with the idea that a brand has to have provenance. It has to, have, it has to tell a story. It has to represent certain values. And so, without knowing anything about branding, of course, we decided on calling it Banyan Tree. Why Banyan Tree? Because that little fishing village where we spent truly the 
the really wonderful initial years of our lives without any money at all, that was Yongxu Wan, which to the Cantonese, uh, well, Yongxu Wan means Banyan Tree Bay. So we chose a name which even now today in our orientation uh, classes to our new recruits and so on, we talk about the origins of Banyan Tree as a name. We talk about Banyan Tree Bay and why? Because we, we've, by explaining to people how the name came about, we are already in the process explaining the values behind Banyan Tree because too many people associate us with luxury. And I always explain to all our colleagues, because it's the first starting point of Banyan Tree and the Banyan Tree culture, is that we're not about luxury. We're not about bling bling, chandeliers, uh, Christoffel silverware, and so on. Banyan Tree is a relatively expensive place to stay because we spend money on, on what we have to build. But it's really not about exclusivity and it's not about luxury. And the whole origin of the name Banyan Tree that we associated with a little fishing village which was pretty poor and it's all just fishing people and it's uh, you know instead of um, uh, the smells of uh, beautiful incense you get the shrimp paste factory next to you you get the night soil that you smell but it's real it's authentic it's about community it's about <clears throat> excuse me it's about people it's about uh, people being intimate romantic enjoying the best times of their lives even if they don't have money. So these are the values of Banyan Tree. And from there we can then talk to, other, to all our associates and to our customers about aspects of branding, that we are an aspirational brand. We are not an exclusive brand. And that's a very important aspect about how you want to position branding also. Prada, Hermes, all trades on exclusivity. I got the Birkin bag, you ain't got the Birkin bag, and that's why the Birkin bag costs $30,000. If there were 20, 30, 40,000 of these bags, exactly the same quality, they wouldn't cost that any, it wouldn't cost anywhere near that amount. So there are a lot of brands that build on the basis of being exclusive. We have rejected all that. We have made it very clear that when we get in Bintan Island, where most of our guests are Singaporeans, when we, and we have a guest book like everybody else, when we see some comments there from people who give HDB addresses and say, you're pretty expensive, but my girlfriend and I love staying there, that to me is much more important than having a whole bunch of cele celebrities and tycoons who do also stay at Banyan Tree, of course. The fact that people aspire towards a brand, I think is a very important part of successful branding. And of course, if you want to be a brand that trades on exclusivity, you can, but then you have to be clear that it has to be really exclusive. But an aspirational brand builds a community of people who believe in that brand, who share in those values. A company like Apple is, is, a, is, is a very good example of that. You've got your HTCs, you've got your, your Xiaomi, you've got Samsung and so on. But a brand like Apple is more of an aspirational brand that people say there's a sensation, broad sense that if I'm an Apple user, you're an Apple user, we're, we're part of a community of people who share the same values that Apple has. So it's very important when you build a brand to build a community of people who share your values. Because I think we've, we've seen it clearly in our business that consumers want to use their purchasing power to the extent that the, the product itself is at least fundamentally good. Everyone wants to use their purchasing power to, I guess, to um, represent or to manifest their own values. So the fact that we do CSR is an important part of who we are. We do it because it is who we are, and therefore a lot of the people who share those same values are part of our community. So to me then, the issue about branding is that branding is all about uh, being able to evoke an emotional response from the user. It's not about a value proposition. It's not about slick advertising and one of the biggest problems I've seen, because I'll get into this a little bit later on, why we started Banyan Tree and why branding to me was so important, was because when I first got back into the family business, we were all contract manufacturers. We have, I've actually gone through a career before I started Banyan Tree at the age of 40. I went back to the family business at the age of 30, so I had about 10 years 
with our family businesses, some of which we've kept and have become very successful in food and agriculture, some of which have completely closed down because they were just contract manufacturing. We have actually assembled televisions for Matsushita. I have done white goods for Samsung. We have uh, we've done all the whole gamut. We've actually also manufactured uh, canvas shoes for Nike and Adidas and so on. But at the end of the day, when you, all you can be is a contract manufacturer, then you're always on the short end of the stick. And Asian companies, when I got into business in the 80s, you didn't have any Asian companies that had their own brands at all. We were all contract manufacturers for other people. Just like, in, just like uh, Foxconn is the world's biggest contract manufacturer for Apple, but the, even they are having a hard time running just to stay still. So I guess my awakening to the importance of branding started when, well, in the 1990s, I, I actually did a, uh, a Nike, a, sh a canvas shoes com uh, company. Within one year of setting it up, I had to close it down. And I had to close it down because we set it up in Thailand. Indonesia became cheaper within, I guess, within a year. And there, that was a kind of a ep ep epiphany for me, a kind of eureka moment when I realized that Essentially, if you're just going to rely on cheap labor and you're going to be cheaper than the next guy and you're doing contract manufacturing, you're always going to be just moving from one location to another. The people who own the business are the people who have the brand. And that's what I would say in business overall, if any of you are entrepreneurs, there's only, in my textbook, there's only two proprietary advantages. When I say proprietary, it's because there's a lot of relative advantages people have. But a relative advantage, for example, is a cost advantage. I'm cheaper than you, but that's a relative one. It's not proprietary. I don't own that cheapness. I happen to be cheaper than you today because I'm assembling in Thailand and you're assembling in the US. When you then move your factory to Cambodia, you're cheaper than me. That relative advantage completely changes. A proprietary advantage is one which you own. And in my textbook, again, there's only two types of proprietary advantages. There's technological, and this brand. Technological, of course, you patent something, and to the extent that patents are enforced, you own that technology. But if you don't have that, what else can you have? What else can you truly own other than technology? You have to own the customer through the brand. And that, to me, was the branding revolution that Asia has now, uh, I see very happily, I see that happening now with younger entrepreneurs today. It used to be, in my days, the biggest thing you wanted to be was to be a contract manufacturer, to assemble things for other people and make tons of money. When I had the epiphany, I realized that we just couldn't do that anymore, and I wanted to have a brand. Now, one of the issues then about branding is about a business is that you, in my view, every successful entrepreneur gets to where he is because of a confluence of luck and intention. And for me, the intention was to have a brand. The luck part was to go into, into this business, the hotel keeping business, which I knew nothing about at all. Um, I was an avid backpacker and that's about all I ever did. But we went into the hotel business by luck and that's another long story altogether. I think I can end now essentially and, and have questions and discussions uh, with all of you about either throwing rocks at policemen about true revolution and race fists, or about more likely a branding a revolution. Branding is something that's really close to my heart. I can go on talking on forever, such as you know, the fact that branding has to originate from the CEO. It is not about advertising companies, all the creative guys out there, you really are important. But if the owner of the brand doesn't really believe in it and believes that advertising will replace the core values of the brand, and that advertising is not just a carrier of what you already have, then I think you're going to fail uh, from day one. So thank you all very much. Please call me KP and not granddaddy and not uh, uncle. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think Mr. Ho is uh, being really humble when, when he said we're kind of scraping the barrel. Um, when, we got, when we got revolution as a team from headquarters, I actually immediately thought of him because um, I remember I was at Business of Design Week in Hong Kong and uh, I, I saw a documentary playing uh, about Banyan Tree 
And uh, I think he was also there as a speaker and he was also there to receive an award for uh, Asian Design Leadership uh, Award. Uh, and Mr. Ho is also the first Asian who received an award from the American Creative Association. So um, yeah, definitely we'll take questions now. <laughs> Uh, please stand if you if you are answering uh, asking a question, please, so that we can fill. Okay. Hi, I'm KP. Um, I'm okay. There's two questions that I want to ask. So, firstly, my company aims to be the number one place, uh, the best place to work in the industry category. So, I would like to know, like, from a leader of a company, how do you make your company the best place to work? And secondly, um, we are hiring um, leaders in other countries that we open in, um, like country managers. So one of the questions we like to ask the country manager is, um, what makes the difference between a leader and a manager? So I'd like to hear your personal opinion on this. What industry categorization are you in? Uh, at tech. In what? Um, tech? Advertising. Oh, advertising. Tech, technology. Okay. Um, okay. Technology okay. company. Well, um, okay, one issue is what's the difference between a leader and a manager, I could go on forever on that topic because that's quite close to my heart. The other one is about how do you get people to want to feel committed to a place, right? You know, they say, I think there have been quite a number of surveys done in business schools and in the military that people fight in a war not for God and country but for the fellow man who's next to him, the soldier next to him. People work in a company not because of the grand values of the company, they work there because of the colleagues. So I think the, the answer to your question is you've got to create an environment where people want to go to work. Again, obviously you hope it's for the grand things that you all are doing, but they like to go to work because they're working with other people that they like to be with. That's really important. A, a really friendly, a sort of inclusive workplace environment is very important. Now obviously, a lot of multinationals in the, uh, are doing things to make it sort of physically very friendly workplace. They give you free food, they give you free drinks, and so on and so forth. That, I think, is only at the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's important to be able to have places you can hang out and so on. But more importantly, at the very top, is you've got to create a, an environment where people don't feel threatened uh, by their bosses, an environment where people feel that they can share things with each other, an environment of trust, and collegiality. If you can do that, then that becomes such a critical part of your culture. Corporate culture is another thing that's really important to me in my stage of life now because although Banyan Tree is not a huge company, we have 35, 37 hotels all spread out across 20 over countries. How do I keep the sensation of being part of a family when we're so spread out? And that's all to do with culture. So if you can develop a culture within your company and people always say, culture is something you can touch and feel, but you can't express. If you were to tell people about what your company culture is about, it's all going to be the same apple, apple pie and motherhood statements, which is what everybody likes to, to subscribe to. But culture is something you can feel, and that's what I think you need to do. In terms of what's the difference between a leader and a manager, I think that's a really good question, because I've given talks on leadership and management, and, I, and I'll tell you one thing, there's a world of difference between the two. A manager is a person who gets things done, who gets other people to do things for him or her. It's pretty instrumental. It's not necessarily uh, inspirational. It is instrumental. You're a good manager. It doesn't mean you have to be loved by people. It doesn't mean you inspire people to die for you. You really know how to manage things and get things done effectively and efficiently. That is the KPI for a manager. To me, a leader is far different. A leader is someone who can inspire people to aspire beyond themselves. And I think that's critically important. A leader is someone who can actually take out the best in every person. And we all want to aspire to more things than what we are. We want to aspire to do better things. We want to aspire to be better people. A leader is someone who can inspire you to do that. And that leader could be your workplace leader, a restaurant manager, it could be a priest, it could be a national leader. A person who inspires you to aspire for bigger things does not have to be a leader with a capital L. It can be a workplace leader in a small little, in a factory, in a restaurant, in a hotel, because the people that you are supposed to lead, all of us want 
to aspire for more things than what we see in our daily grinding lives. And the leader is someone who can inspire you to believe in more than what you're doing every day. And I think that's the, the important difference. Um, maybe before that, uh, KP, just, I, I remember watching the documentary and um, your staff actually stay in the resort. Would you, would you want to um, elaborate on that, on company culture, that the staff actually lives in the resort as well? Well, they, we, we believe in a few issues about, about values, okay? Uh, there are two things I guess you can, you can touch upon. One was about the, the fact that all our staff, when we open a hotel, all our staff, down to the kitchen maid, whoever, is invited to stay in the hotel with their families. And that's really simple. If you want a service provider to be able to provide really good service to the guest, shouldn't that service provider know what the guest's life is going to be like? I mean, it's a no-brainer. If, if we want our, our service staff to really understand what binary tree is like, they must live a binary tree lifestyle too. And also, they must understand what it's like to be respected by other service staff. That means their own colleagues when they live in the hotel. So that's a very fundamental part of what we try to do. Another part of the values that we do is the, the, the fact that we know people don't just give service for, for its own sake. We all have to maintain our livelihoods, particularly in the service industry. People aren't terribly well paid. So there's an issue of service charges. Most countries that impose service charges, they distribute service charges to all the staff, which is a no-brainer also. We do that in all our hotels. Unfortunately, you get bad service in Singapore because all proprietors in Singapore, they keep the service charges for themselves. In China, all proprietors keep service charges to themselves. We are the only hotel chain in all of China, and we've done a survey on this, including the huge guys like Starwood, Intercon, they've got hundreds of hotels in China, we're the only company that refuses to manage any hotel where the owners do not distribute their service charge. Because to us, that is part of the social con contract between us and the employee. You work hard, the guests enjoy the, 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 the place that they're at, they give a higher service charge by the, by the fact that they patronize you, and it goes back to your livelihood directly. That is part of the social contract we have and that builds up that culture of trust. And it builds up the culture of trust where one of the most, I think, most gratifying experiences I've had with Banyan Tree was after the financial crisis in uh, 2009, when we thought we might run out of cash because everybody was so cash tight. And in order to sort of foresee, anticipate the problem rather than be hit by a credit crunch, we took a decision that we were going to, to ask for non-paid leave from all our associates. Unpaid leave would mean essentially you're lending money to the company. And we said until the crisis passes, which could be long months, I myself would take a 50% pay cut, my VPs would take 40%, and down to the service staff, they would take 10%. By law, you're not allowed to do this unilaterally. So we had town hall meetings in every one of our hotels. And we had to simply, I had to go up and address everyone and say, can you do this with us? It has to be voluntary, you have to sign, and, and agree to it. Everyone agreed. So having gone through a bad time together, and when times got good, we paid back all the money that was due to them and more. It's when you go through difficult times together as a company, as a community, that you build up that trust. And that builds up part of the culture that we have in Banyan Tree today. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Sorry for the long-winded uh, answers. Okay, sure. Um, hi, KP. Thank you for sharing your story as well as your, as your perspective. A uh, really best way to spend a Friday morning. Uh, so it was incredibly inspiring. Thank you. My name is Shan, um, and I work at a design consultancy. Um, and we are a team of young, optimistic, creative designers, um, international as well as a local team. Um, and, we, and just this week, we were staying up to have movie night, where we were watching a movie um, that was based on Ai Weiwei, the artist and dissident. And we had this discussion um, at the end of the movie where we were like, what are the fights that we fight for today? Um, because um, all over the world, you have young people um, in getting, taking to the streets and uprisings um, from Egypt to Hong Kong. Um, and then in, here we are living in first world comfort where the only things that occupy us are maybe our jobs, our smartphones, uh, where to buy a house. 
uh, and, and, and how to aspire towards um, greater things for ourselves, sorry. Um, and so I guess my question for you is, um, at, at the juncture of this, um, at the juncture of, um, of our life as a nation, um, when you look to the next generation, um, being a father and a grandfather, um, what, to you, uh, what to you would define the good fight um, moving forward for our generation? How do I define what? The good fight. The good fight. Things that are worth yeah. fighting for. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think the good fight is a very personal fight. It is a fight within yourself to get outside your comfort zone, to do things that have meaning to you, to live a purposeful life. And I don't think any young Singaporean should feel guilty that because they are demonstrating in Hong Kong or in Burma or elsewhere, and we live relatively comfortable lives, we should not just feel guilty because of that. It's because we do live in a more stable and secure environment. So there's not a need, at least for now, there's not a need to go onto the streets and demonstrate and so on. People demonstrate on streets when there's a need to do so. And I don't think young Singaporeans are not demonstrating simply because they're complacent. It's because there are not that many issues. So the good fight is not one that's measured against whether people are really fighting by throwing rocks and stones and endangering themselves. And because people are involved in the Arab Spring, they are fighting the good fight. And here we're not because we're comfortable. That would be my first answer. The second part is the good fight is important to all of us. And the good fight for all of us is to look around yourself and to say, within my own environment, what are the critical issues? Look at Singapore. Singapore is not a perfect state. We've got a lot of problems. Our problems are different from problems elsewhere. What can I do as a young person to make this a better place? And I see it happening. I mean, I've been giving the, the Northern Lectures, and one of the things that's been interesting to me throughout the five courses of the Northern Lectures is how increasingly with every lecture, there's more and more young people attending. Uh, it used to be all first lecture was all my friends, all my age group, and more and more young people came. And when you interact with them, I really do get a sense that the, gen the young generation today are very deeply committed to improving the lives of Singaporeans. There's a keen awareness of inequality in Singapore, there's a keen awareness of the problems that we have, and a keen awareness of self-agency, which we didn't really have in, for Singaporeans of my generation. It was either you attack the government, or you basically sat back and they did everything for you. The sense of self-agency among young people today, I think, is very important. A lot of young people now don't particularly care about party politics that much. I mean, fine, but it doesn't matter. It's not about PAP oppressing my life, or I ask the PAP for favors. It's really one of, I'm living in this community today. What can I do with the NGOs I work with? What can I do with the people around me to make this a better world? And ultimately, to me, the question is not just a good fight. It is really one of, have I lived a purposeful life, or have I just lived every day kind of eyes wide shut and sort of just going through life and not really at the end of it, when you get to be my age and older, you look back and say, was it a meaningful, purposeful fight that I had? Thank you. I forgot to mention that we're also giving away a one year Skillshare scholarship uh, for the best question. Um, so yeah, do we have another question? The most embarrassing question uh, gets you the, uh, the prize. The most embarrassing question. Uh, hi, KP. My name is Tra. I'm from Singapore Management University. And okay. I just from SMU. Oh. oh. Yeah. I, I could see the brilliance there already, you know. <laughs> that, whatever question you're going to ask, it doesn't matter. She gets a prize, okay? I just took my finals last week, and I have one question for you. What is the best career advice that you have ever gotten? The best career advice? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, because I didn't get good career advice from my <laughs> career counselors, that's where I am. I've, I mean, my career is about the most checkered career you could possibly imagine. So, okay, so now I have to give you career advice, okay, because I'm a... <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking I could be young enough to be taking advice, but now I've got to give advice. Um, my, my serious advice to you, looking back on my own life, when I had to give a talk once about turning points in my life, is that I don't think you should see your life as a career as defined by 
the way people can define it, you know, lawyer, restaurateur, journalist, whatever, advertising person, whatever. I don't think you should define your career as a profession. You should define your career in one way as the things that you really want to do in life that interest you and taking the job that most meets that interest you have in life, which people like to call passion and so on, but I don't like the word passion because it's a bit too icky. But the things that really make you excited, that's one point. But on the other hand, that has to be tempered by the recognition that everything you do in life, it adds up finally to the person who you are. So by saying that, I think what I'm trying to say is that if you just go from job to job, doing different things, flitting around from here and there, because different things interest you, I think you're not going to get anywhere. Because at the end of the day, everything that you do builds to be who you are. So you must have that awareness on one hand that you don't get yourself slotted to become a lawyer or this or that simply because that's a profession with a capital P. You should feel more flexible about things. But on the other hand, you have to realize that time passes. You're getting older and everything that you've done in the past should be building you up for whatever things you're doing in future. So always just bear those two things in mind and I think you will become your own best uh, career counselor. Um, we have a question here. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for such a great speech. I just, it's kind of, I hope it's not an offensive question, just I'm really curious because in the past you talked about how you were promoting um, communism and communist ideals and now here you are talking about branding and marketing which is really a capitalism free market sort of thing. How do you reconcile the differences or what happened that made this change? You know, that's a good question because I've kept in touch. Well, first of all, I was never a communist. I was called a communist. <laughs> and there's a slight difference there, okay? I'm a confessed communist, okay? But yes, I was obviously much more activist, much more socialistic, etc. But I wasn't that different from quite a number of my counterparts of my age group uh, of that time who were, I guess, student radicals would be probably a more accurate word than communists. We were all student activists, we were all student radicals. We were all imbued by very idealistic notions of what the world should be like, etc. You will find that many of us in whatever things that we are doing today haven't given up a lot of those things. We've just transformed it. I have seen my, my counterparts in Stanford days, they are now working in very respectable jobs. Obviously, we would have to be more working in respectable jobs, earning more money, we've got families to support, etc. But the basic fire of idealism that we had is not snuffed out. It's just expressed in different ways. And that's very important to me personally because I don't, I have mellowed, I have learned that a lot of the things that I was radical about, I was just purely headstrong about, and so on. You, you learn through experience. But the things that I'm doing today, the things I'm doing through SMU, the things that I'm doing through, uh, through Banyan Tree, clearly, are expressions of that same spirit of wanting to change the world that I had earlier. But in those days, you wanted to change the world. Now you only want to change the community of people you're with, and eventually, you recognize that whatever little change you can make, little though it may be, it's still change. So you, you narrow your visions, but you become more realistic, but the, in, but the same seed of wanting to live a purposeful life doesn't ever go away. So I don't think there's a contradiction. It's basically a transformation and a re-expression of the same sentiments. Maybe we can take one more. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll go over there. Hang on. Hi, good morning, KP. Thank you for the, the talk. Um, I come from a family business background myself, and I guess we've ventured into different uh, businesses ourselves. But my question is more, uh, why did you choose hotels to be the, the brand that you probably spend the most time in? And why hotels, both from the softer joys it brings you and from the investment and business side of the business? If, if I had to, the honest answer is that if I had to live it all over again, I'm not quite sure it would be hotels. Um, I earlier said that I ended 
by saying that um, uh, it was a confluence of luck and intention that we, we started Banyan Tree. Intention meaning I've always known I wanted to do a brand. Uh, I gave you the background to that. And why hotels? The honest answer is exactly what I'm going to tell you now. It wasn't waking up one morning and saying, I want to build the world's best hotel brand. It was in fact, again, a series of, of incidents, which leads me to the conclusion that entrepreneurship for a lot of people like myself is a confluence of luck and intent. It started out even while I was managing our other businesses with my wife, my brother, who's an architect and myself walking along the beach of Phuket way back in the 80s and wanting to buy a piece of land for a summer house. We saw a piece of land, we bought it for a summer house which never got built. We kept on walking and we came across this totally denuded moonscape which was an abandoned tin mine and never having gone to uh, business school, not, never having heard the word due diligence, we bought it for a song and we developed it. In the course of developing it, nobody wanted to manage our hotels and so on, but we built one after the other. And finally, on the last piece of land, it had no beach. So all the smart guys who are hotel uh, operators wouldn't manage our hotel. The other ones that we built were managed by Sheraton, by Ducid, designed by my brother and myself. We invested in it, but we didn't manage it. Finally, nobody wanted to manage that piece of land, that hotel that we built there. And so that was our eureka moment because around that same time I had closed the shoe factory recognizing that I was sick and tired of building things for other people. And the eureka moment was, okay, why don't we do our own hotel brand? Probably the most stupid notion in the world. But hey, I'm an expert on hotels. Why? Because I like to backpack. And my wife and I backpacked everywhere and we stayed in different low-end hotels and, and you know, different hostels and so on. And that, of course, qualifies you to be the instant expert. So we wanted to do a hotel. They had no beach. And this is another lesson point, I think, that innovation comes out of necessity. The things that we were known for, which now, of course, is a dime a dozen everywhere, we originated the concept of the all pool villa hotel. You know, where you have every, every unit, every key is a, a pool villa. We originated that because we said, well, if, you know, if we don't have no beach, how can we tell them to come and stay here? Well, give them a bloody pool. <laughs> so we built pools. Then we, we've also originated the whole idea of the tropical garden spa, uh, which now again is a dime a dozen, but 20 years ago, Banyan Tree Spa was the first thing to actually feature tropical garden spas. And the origin of that was not because I ever wanted to do spas. It was because, okay, now we have convinced them to stay at the hotel, at this villa, because it's got a pool. How do we make sure that they can stay more than one night? Well, let's give them a spa. So, I mean, I say this a bit facetiously, there's a lot more work than that, but essentially that's how we got into the hospitality business. It was pure fluke to do the first banyan tree. Because the first banyan tree really took off, and then we built the second and the third. So after about four banyan trees, we came to recognize that, yes, this could be the vehicle to achieve what I've always wanted to achieve, which is a strong brand. And today, I also I tell other people, as well as my own colleagues, Banyan Tree, if it has taught anything at all to anyone, is not about hotel keeping, etc. It's about the fact that if you pursue it correctly with the brand always at the heart of everything that you do, it would dominate everything, then you do have a chance of building a brand that can, that can exist, a brand that has got long legs to travel, beyond Asia. And that is my biggest, biggest hope, that an Asian brand that started here can go around the world and can be recognized as a, not as an Asian brand, but as a strong brand wherever we go. And one of the reasons, one of the, my sources of pride would be, for example, when we built two hotels in Mexico and they're seen as, they've, been, they've won awards as being the best hotels in all of Mexico and our Mexican associates are so proud of it and they don't see it as, oh, this is a Singapore brand. They see it as their brand, and we are recognized as a strong Mexican brand. That would be, I think, the final uh, aspiration that I have. Okay, um, just giving the one last question. Thank you, KP. I'm Kelvin. I run a fashion technology startup. I always want to ask you this question is, what's the best piece of advice or wisdom you would give for someone who may 
contemplate entering business with their wife. <laughs> contemplate business with a wife? Yes. As co-founders, for example. You doing something with your wife? No, I was contemplating and then I backed out. <laughs> Smart <you>. man. <laughs> Thank you. Can, can I ask you some questions? <laughs> Why did you back out? Because your marriage was more important. Correct, and she was fierce. She's what? She was quite fierce. She's quite fierce. Okay. But you need to be the boss. That's why you couldn't do it, because she's too first, fierce. My first and last, sorry. The first and That's last project. That's not to be the best question. No, <laughs> first, no for, honestly, first and last project was planning our wedding. <laughs> together, so, oh, so your first and last project was planning your wedding, and it was so disastrous, <laughs> you decided you... Are you still married? <laughs> okay. He's still married. I can't give you a decent reply here because my daughter's in the room and she's going to call my wife <laughs> right away after this, you know, so... I guess... I think... There are two sides to, that, to the whole issue. On one hand, my wife is my closest colleague, my closest friend. But on the other hand, we have to be really careful to demarcate areas which are hers and which is mine. So if, you are, if any of you are contemplating doing a business with your, with your spouse, your, part, your life partner, you have to always bear that in mind. There are downsides and there's also huge upsides. The huge upside is that you are embarking, you know, the huge upside is simply this. We spend more of our time working than we do in other pursuits. Right? And so therefore, if you can have a life partner who can share with you that part of the journey, not just the part of the journey to build up a family, the part of the journey about emotional links, but can share that part of the journey to create something jointly together, and you discuss all the things that you're going to do together, the upside of it is huge. The pride that you have in it, the community that you build, you work, you bounce off each other, I think there's a lot of advantages to husband-wife businesses. But there's also a lot of downfall. First of all, if your wife is fiercer than you, as is your wife and my wife, then there's less of a downfall. We just listen to them and that's it, right? Um, we have the nominally bigger titles, but they run the show. That is presumably a joke, okay? Um, but that's the one that I want my daughter to carry to my wife. The downside of it is because it is so intense, it can, any small frictions that you would normally have with a colleague, a pure colleague, can completely get blown uh, out of proportion because it is such an emotional relationship at the same time. So you have to make sure that you, the upside you don't have to worry about because you, you can feel that upside. What you have to always worry about is to be careful of the downside that an emotional, that Normally, we all have emotional arguments too over cleaning things, over this, over money and all that. When it's over work, it can actually explode and it can endanger the business itself. So always just be aware of the downside. Always try to create boundaries of respect that this is your area. I will advise you, but I will not run it for you and you respect my area. And I think with that, it can be a very meaningful, uh, very happy uh, life experience. Thank you, KP. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to ask him who he thinks is best and just discuss a little bit uh, who we should award the scholarship to. Um, so, I was thinking, Shan, to ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Shan. Uh, no, Shan, the lady. The lady Which was question? Watch, uh, she was watching Ai Weiwei. Uh -huh. yeah. And the uh, question was what? Um, something about revolution. I, I don't remember. Okay, sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we, we decided to give Shan this scholarship. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get your name card later. Oh, you'd like to pass it to her? That's awesome. All right, sure. Yeah, so Skillshare is basically a learning platform, and you're going to have access to all the um, courses over there on entrepreneurship, uh, on creative skills, and all that. So um, I'm gonna. Get, do you have a name card or something? Uh, uh, but I'll get your contact later. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, can we put a, uh, give a round of applause for our speaker? Thank you. Thank you.